there are two similar situations to the one we just read about, uh, where someone comes in the middle of the night and makes a request. Now, the last one was just a few weeks ago, let me remind you. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread and a friend from, for a friend of mine has arrived at my house for, from a journey and I have nothing to offer him. And he, and he says in reply from in, do not bother me, the door has already been locked. My children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visitor the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. Well, today we just heard that he was knocking and pleading and the door was closed. The, I think, trick is to realize that the first case, the person was a friend and even though the friend was denied to begin with, the friendship held and after he persisted, the master answered his request and gave him what he wanted. And I think that's key to the reading we just heard. If we can say, okay, God is my friend or uh, I'm a friend of God and God is befriended, that there's a relationship there that's fundamental, that's key, then, then I think that's the way in which the whole, the gate, the door is open. In John's gospel, Jesus was called the gate, that I am the gate, I am the uh, shepherd, I am the one who allows the sheep to come in and go out. And so we see that whole, no matter how big or little it is, as the person of Jesus Christ and focus on that, I think we've got the answer to how we should proceed. What's happening here is he's heading toward Jerusalem. And all of the crowds who seemed to gather around Jesus maybe a couple years ago when he was preaching and teaching and healing, now start to dissipate. And some of those who fall away are disciples. And he's encouraging them to hold on, to stay steadfast, to persevere, to be a part of what's coming, of what's ahead. Mark Brennan, the vicar bishop, who was our vicar bishop for the past three years, is now the, vicar, is now the bishop of Wheeling, Charleston, West Virginia. His installation was this past week. In his homily, he pleaded with the people of West Virginia to stay close, to hold on. Many of them told him, I'm leaving the, I'm leaving the church. I, I can't put up with all the stuff that I see. Their bishop was removed for malfeasance. So Bishop Brennan said, look, and, and one of the parishioners came up even before mass and said, Bishop, I know many are leaving. I'm not. To whom shall we go but to the Lord? saying, the Lord is the one who really is the center of all of this, and I need to stay close to the Lord. So I, I, his words, I think, had a powerful effect on that congregation, that, that diocese, to say, we know what's happened. We're going to try to make amends and correct it and make sure that things are set straight for the future, and those who have been involved in, in things that are unworthy are disciplined. I, I didn't like that word in the first reading, or the second reading, of the father who scourges his son. Did you pick that up? Scourges his son, <laughs> tough love. I picture my dad coming home after work and my mother must have said something to him. There were five of us boys. And as soon as he walks in the front door, he strips off his belt. He never used it, but it was pretty effective. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't recommend scourging even even though that's what happened to Jesus. And, and Jesus knew what was coming up. He, he, he foresaw the, the problems that lay ahead, and he was trying to encourage the disciples, look, things are going to get tough. Remember last week, I've not come for peace, but conflict, division. He's trying to build the, the disciples up for some bad news, some things are going to happen, and, and pleading with them to stay focused and on board to look to the future. Um, this is a little piece, uh, I, I think it could be called a poem, but it's more of a, an essay than a poem. If I don't. It's by a Sister Miriam Pollard, and it's entitled Something Greater. 
What if we had been born and lived and died in a tomb? What if we had never seen the day begin or grow or fade, never seen a sunrise or a sunset or a rainbow, never seen the snowfall or heard the rain beating on the roof? And then one day, out of a thousand days that one could not recognize as days, a voice called out of the darkness promising, there is more. There is a greater thing beyond this unrelenting, small, constricting world into which you have been born, and in whose darkness you curl upon yourself moment after unseeing moment as if there were nothing else. What if, indeed? And then, what if you felt your hand being taken, yourself being led, led somewhere you knew not, led somewhere you knew not of, your eyes growing accustomed to a growing light, your feet set on a path, a path when you had never before felt the ground beneath them? There is something greater here, so much greater that your imagination could never have brought it up out of the dark out of the stillness, out of the nothingness of what had been. Our lives are so small, our lives, the lives to which we cling, and the successes and satisfactions that flicker in the dark are rooms so small, so inconsequential and unreal that they disappear entirely in the light of what awaits beyond. The trick is to believe to believe that it is there, to live as if one's longings were not bounded by the dark and one's life a steady paschal candle, burning up the darkness, pushing out the walls. To live in faith is to agree that our infinitesimal regrets and longings are tombs and mines and endless nights in comparison with the life that beckons from the stricken heart of him who waits for us and takes our hands, him who lights the road, who makes the road, who is the road. That's our Lord, huh? that's Jesus Christ. That's the one that calls us here, that is the focal point of our worship. Sometimes we think the church without Christ is the worship and that's terribly wrong, that's terribly wrong. It's Christ himself who is our focal point, the one that we keep before us, the one that we keep offering our prayers to, our pledges to, and who we come to when we feel that we've not measured up. He's asked us to measure up. He's asked us to be willing to see the small places in our world where he is and join him there the small places that become hugely large because of a father who is not giving up on his creation, because of a father who raises his son to life, eternal life in the resurrection. We know that. Our faith reminds us of that every minute, that there's joy out there, that there's a consequential happiness that awaits us. But in the midst of conflict, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of feeling very much caught up in despair, we can forget that. We can just put it aside and say, I know the truth. The reality is this does not exist. That what you see is what you get. That it's this place and no other place. And Jesus is saying, no, it's out there, it's more, it's here, it's within me. And he's the one who is the focal point of our worship, the bread of life and the cup of salvation this very minute, reaching down and taking our hand. Please stand.